So there I was on the 38th day of the fast. It was like the veil between the temporary and the earthly and the eternal and the heavenly became very thin, like I could see straight through it. And I saw Jesus, the eternal life, shining in all his glory. And it was like, he's real, it's real. He showed me just how much death is swallowed up in life. Our time here is so small and eternity is so big. The things that I was obsessing over before the fast, they had to bow the knee. I found that I just didn't have the energy for my idols anymore. May 12th, day 38, I saw the eternal life and we have nothing to fear but the beautiful Lord himself. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You can get a little appetizer, like a little taste of that spiritual reality when you fast. But to go and be with the Lord is better by far. In April last year, the Lord called me into a 40-day fast. And while I can say the whole fast was very challenging and very blessed, something very special happened three days from the end of the fast, so the 38th day on May 12th, when I saw the Lord Jesus and I heard him saying, come up here. And I knew he wasn't just talking to me, but he was talking to the whole church. And in this glorious vision of the Lord, he had a very distinct message that I wanna share with you. It was like there were three scenes from the Bible taking place simultaneously. One, where Jesus stood atop of the Mount of Transfiguration. Two, where Elijah met with the Lord on Mount Horeb. And three, where Moses had gone up that same mountain even earlier to meet with God face to face in the cloud. And all of Israel was at the base of the mountain. The heart of God and the message that the Lord has for me and for you in this encounter is so precious and the wisdom of God in it is beyond anything that I could have concocted or manufactured in my own intellect or strength. So before we go any farther, will you just pray with me? Precious and holy Father, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Jesus, thank you that your heart for your church is that we would have such intimate relationship with you. God, thank you for the invitation to come up where you are, that we would be in your presence, that we would know your love, that we would see the face of God in the face of Jesus, and that we would be set free from fear as your perfect love lays hold of us and the spirit of adoption lays hold of us, that we would know that we're children of God. Who are they that overcome the world but those that believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And you've overcome the world and you've given us a place with you, seated in heavenly places. God, to go and be with you is better by far, but give us strength to be here today and to shine a light in this dark world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. I know so many of you, like me, have set out to fast and had some success and some failures and have so many questions about fasting. And there can be a lot of fear going into longer extended fast. So I wanna talk about some of the practicalities of this fast that the Lord led me in. And then I wanna talk about seeing the Lord Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration and the message that God has for us. It's not by strength, not by might, not because I'm a super Christian, but because God is good. And it's the same for all of us who have put our trust in Jesus. So the first thing, on a practical level, 40 days of fasting, that is no small thing. And nobody should enter into a 40 day fast lightly. I really honestly believe that the Lord has to be leading you into it to do it. And you must be fasting for the right reasons because then in all humility before the Lord, he can lead you with wisdom and how you should fast because every person is different. It's not about proving anything. It's about being obedient to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And if we fast with religious mindsets, it can become very, very dangerous. Remember, when Jesus, our example, went into the wilderness to fast, it was because he was driven, led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. While I think regular one-day to three-day fasts are very important for our spiritual health, and we can and should do those of our own volition, just to discipline our flesh and keep our spirits in the position of authority, a 40-day fast is something that God needs to lead you into. Fasting is not putting money into a vending machine so you can get something from God that you want. Fasting is surrendering your heart and your will to God so that He can lead you however He wants. 
So practically speaking, on this 40 day fast, I started off doing just water. About four or five days in, I was having such intense burning pain in my stomach and severe insomnia, and it felt very unsafe. I was trying with all my might to just persevere, almost religiously, when I went to my mother-in-law's house, my wife's mom's house, and she brought out some bone broth that was given to her. And as soon as she offered it, I knew that I knew that God was saying, it is okay for you to have this bone broth and you should have this bone broth. That's how he led me. You need to be willing to let God lead you how he'll lead you, whether it's with even more grace to have something else during your fast or in being more strict. God knows you and he knows how to lead you. For me, I was still working full time, still taking care of my wife and two little girls and putting out a lot of energy in needing to be present. I wasn't hiding in a cave somewhere or off in a literal wilderness somewhere. And I think this was God's grace to me during the fast. So as the days went on for the rest of my fast, I would occasionally have bone broth. And once I got over halfway through the fast, I was having bone broth and even another kind of broth that had a few more calories in it. And I did that all the way to the finish line. I lost 40 pounds during this fast, even doing it with the broth. So I'm saying all this to you because you need to be very careful and you need to make sure you are following the leadership of the Holy Spirit for your fast. That's the most glorious part about fasting is you find that you become more sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, more sensitive to his presence, and your conscience becomes very tender. And I found that when I had the bone broth, it wasn't a violation of my conscience. I still had the sweet presence of the Lord with me, and I knew that he was pleased still with the way that I was pursuing him. So let him be your guide. It's really good to prepare yourself to go into a fast by starting to reduce your caloric intake and to drink a lot of water. For me, I even began the whole thing doing a saltwater flush for a couple of days just to get everything out of my system. If you can do things to get yourself into ketosis before going full-blown water fast, that's hugely beneficial. But you'll have to go through that very uncomfortable transition for the first few days either way. Don't give up early on because it actually gets easier when your body starts to burn fat for fuel and your brain begins to use ketones for fuel. You won't feel as hangry, though you will still feel a little bit more lethargic. When you're going into the fast, you wean yourself off. And when you're ending your fast, you have to be very careful because there's something called refeeding syndrome and it can be really detrimental to your health. It can actually be traumatizing to your cells if you just pump your body full of calories and sugar right after a long fast. Which is why for me, I highly recommend that you use bone broth because you can begin to get really good healing nutrition into your body and into your gut. And then you can start to reintroduce gentle things to your stomach and begin to get your caloric intake back up to where it was. Because the Lord's not seeking to hurt you, but if we are careless and impulsive, fasting can backfire in your health. So just be careful and be attentive to the Lord. Probably the most wonderful benefit of fasting is bringing your flesh and your impulses down so that your spirit man the born-again spirit inside of you that's been there since you put your trust in Jesus can have more expression than all the chaotic noise of our natural minds. It feels very uncomfortable when you're addicted to letting your flesh run the show, but you'll find that it's freedom for your spirit to take the place of authority in your life. So if you're hungering and thirsting for Jesus, and if you're wondering why you're having such a hard time following God the way your heart knows it should, fasting is such a tool that we need. When teaching about fasting and giving and praying, Jesus didn't say if you fast, he said when you fast. Because if the Son of God himself needed to fast in his walk in obedience to God the Father through the Holy Spirit, how much more do we need need to fast so that we can learn to walk like he walked and to bring our flesh under submission to the leading of the Holy Spirit. So the whole fast was blessed in that sense that even though it was challenging, the preciousness of the presence of God, I found that I just didn't have the energy for my idols anymore. The things that I was obsessing over before the fast, they had to bow the knee to my pursuit of Jesus. And that was actually the reason for this fast when the Lord called me into it. He had shown me that I was acting like Martha and I needed to act like Mary. He said, you're concerned about many things, but only one thing is needed. I want you to sit at my feet and learn from me. So it was on day 38 in the morning, 
I set myself to just worship. And while I was in worship that morning, the presence of God absolutely overwhelmed me. When the encounter began, it was like the Lord took Philippians 1, 21 to 24, and just magnified it in my heart. And I wrote in my journal here, so I'm going to read this first and then I'll explain the vision that came after. And in a second, I'll show you the video clip that I recorded from that moment. May 12th, day 38. It says, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose, but I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ. For that is very much better, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. And I wrote, The fear of death is a prison for us, and Jesus has set the captives free. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. So there I was on the 38th day of the fast, and as I was in worship, it was like the veil between the temporary and the earthly and the eternal and the heavenly became very thin, like I could see straight through it. And I saw Jesus, the eternal life, shining in all his glory. And it was like, he's real. It's real. What have I been so afraid of all this time? Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He's really alive right now. And we will really be alive with him forever. Not even death can separate us from the love of God. But when we die, to go and be with the Lord is better by far. Suddenly, it wasn't like, oh my gosh, I'm so afraid of this or that or the other thing in this life. It was like, let those things come if it means that it'll send me on to my Lord so I can be with him face to face forever. And as his love was being more perfected in me, that perfect love was casting out all my fear of death. And I saw how our time here is so small and eternity is so big. When we're there, we'll look at our lives and see how it was really just the blink of an eye. And we'll wish that we had more courage in this life. And the Lord was saying, Oh, you of little faith, don't be afraid. I have overcome the world. Oh, I'm a soppy mess right now. And I have to share the revelation that the Lord just poured through my heart in worship this morning. He showed me just how much death is swallowed up in life that the Lord Jesus embodied all of sin and death and those who have put their trust in him have passed from death to life. And he says that to go and be with the Lord is better by far than to endure here in faith. Obviously we do and we have the strength and empowerment of the seal of the Holy Spirit to endure with strength in this life. But to go and be with the Lord is better by far. Oh, you of little faith, why don't you believe you don't have to be afraid you will have trouble in this world but take heart jesus has overcome the world and one day soon in the twinkling of an eye we will all see him face to face and he will wipe away every tear and that was when i saw the lord jesus on top of this mountain he was saying come up here Come up here above the fear of death. Come up here above all the chaos and the noise of the world. And he was longing for me to come and see Jesus face to face. Jesus is the express image of the invisible God. Everything that we want to know about God is revealed by God through his son, Jesus Christ. And as my heart burned to join Jesus at the top of this mountain, I could hear in his heart as he spoke this invitation to me that there was a longing and almost a grief in his heart. And that's when I saw at the base of the mountain, a whole multitude of people. And I knew that they were the church, that they were his bride, but they were down at the bottom of the mountain and they were celebrating and they were happy to be at the mountain of God, but they wouldn't come up to meet Jesus at the top of the mountain where he was calling them to. And just like that, I knew that the Lord had taken the Mount of Transfiguration and Mount Sinai with Moses and the Israelites, and even Mount Horeb, which is Mount Sinai, with Elijah the prophet and kings, and compressed them into this vision where I saw Jesus on top of the mountain and the church down below. And he had this sense of grief for the people that wouldn't come up. Because just like what happened with the Israelites when Moses went up the mountain to meet with God, they were saying, don't let God talk to us ourselves, but you go and speak with God. 
because if he speaks to us, we'll surely die. But that was the whole point of the revelation. Jesus comes and says, lose your life for my sake that you could truly find it. These people at the base of the mountain, they didn't want to die to themselves to live to Christ. And we all know what happened at the base of the mountain in Moses' day. Even though God had led them to the holy mountain, they quickly fell into idolatry and the worship of those things that are not God and fell into judgment. Moses pleaded with the people saying, don't be afraid, God is wanting to test you and to put the fear of God in you so that you won't sin against him. But they wouldn't have it. In Exodus 20, 18 to 21, it says, all the people perceived the thunder and lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. And Moses said to the people, don't be afraid for God has come in order to test you in order that the fear of him rather than anything else may remain with you so that you may not sin. It's exactly like that with the church today. God is calling us to pursue him with prayer and with fasting, that we would put our flesh in its rightful place, that God would cast out all our fear because we fear nothing more than we just fear him, and that we would be free from all the idolatry of, of money and success, of the pride of life and the lust of the eyes of looking like something to the world. But so many people are addicted to the flesh and they won't come up the mountain where Jesus is to the Mount of Transfiguration, because this is the bottom line. Religion might draw you close to the mountain of God, but it's only Jesus and relationship with God that will bring you up into the dark cloud to meet with him face to face, to be delivered from the fear of death. For the people, it was enough to have a mediator between them and God. But for God, he sent Jesus to remove all the middlemen between you and him because the fullness of God dwelt in Jesus bodily. So when we fellowship with Jesus, we fellowship with God. Just like Jesus said, whoever opens up to me, the Father and I will come and establish our home with him. The Holy Spirit of God is also called the Spirit of Jesus Christ. If you have the Son, you have the Father also. He wants to fellowship with you in spirit and in truth. He seeks for such to worship him. Do you know that it's actually a ministry to the heart of God? That God actually desires something? God doesn't need anything from anyone. He is the maker of all things, but he desires, he seeks for such to worship him. He desires for his children to come in fellowship with him. Just a few days ago in prayer, I was worshiping and I felt the Father's joy. And I was almost taken aback because I was like, wow, there's so much delight here in your presence. And I know that there's a place in you that's grieving for the world, and that's hurting for the lost. And I know that the Bible calls Jesus the man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And he responded to my heart and he said, yes, I am. And I was the man of sorrows. Yes, I do grieve for the world and for the lost. But I find such delight in the presence of my children. You were the reward that was set before me, for which I endured the cross, despising the shame, and I could feel his pleasure as I sat with him and worshipped him in spirit and in truth. And it was the first time I realized that our affection for Jesus is a comfort, is like salve on his wounds, which he still carries in his glorified body. As much as he is the comforter to us, we were the reward of his suffering. Those of us who have recognized that is the Son of God, and I will give him my life. He is worthy of all my affection. He is worthy of my faith. He is worthy to be worshipped and crowned with glory and honor forever and ever. It's incredible the way the Lord put these three biblical encounters together, because while Moses went up through the cloud to encounter God, and he came back with his face shining, we didn't yet see exactly who he met with. Then again with Elijah, we hear the still small voice of the Lord. He wasn't in the shaking, in the earthquake, in the fire, in the wind, but the still small voice began to comfort Elijah. So you have Moses who represents the law on this holy mountain encountering God. Then you have Elijah who represents the prophets encountering God. And then finally you have Jesus, the revelation 
the Son of God on the Mount of Transfiguration, who is the person that was in the cloud with Moses. God, who was and is and is to come, who transcends the time and the space that he made for us to dwell in. And you see it crystal clear because who was with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration but Moses and Elijah. God is calling all of us up to be there with him in that timeless place. At the base of the mountain is all the noise and the chaos of idolatry. But at the top of the mountain is Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, who has triumphed over sin and death once for all. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, the express image of the invisible God, the God of the universe, Emmanuel, God with us, God becoming like us, suffering with us and for us, the eternal life coming and meeting us in our sin and death and breaking its power over us when we trust in him and believe in him. He's the resurrection and the life, and now we are resurrected with him and partakers of the eternal life. And when all the rest has faded away and passed away, the eternal word of God made flesh will remain, and we've become one with him, the bride of Christ, his church, one body with him, of which he's the head, and his spirit indwelling all of us. The last thing I wrote that day in my journal entry was, I saw the eternal life, and we have nothing to fear but the beautiful Lord himself. So don't be afraid to come out on the water with Jesus where he's calling you. He's not trying to hurt you. He's trying to set you free. Jesus himself said, some kinds come not out but by prayer and fasting. There's certain bondages that break when we fast and pray, not just for us, but for people around us too. The Lord touched my whole house through this fast. He pointed my heart away from idols and back towards my beautiful wife and daughters. He set me free from striving and idolatry, something that I knew I needed to be free from, from a previous revelation, but didn't know how to set myself free from. My family, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, will all see Jesus face to face. So draw near to him now. Don't wait. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You can get a little appetizer, like a little taste of that spiritual reality when you fast when you bring your flesh low and set your heart, your mind, and your will and your emotions on Jesus with all your strength. It's like the veil gets thin and you can see the lover of your soul, Yeshua HaMashiach, the resurrection and the life, who has your life securely in his hand and he will never let you go. How many times does he tell us, don't be afraid? This is one way that you can help him teach you how to let go of all your fear and to follow him in spirit and in truth.